by injecting a bit of personality and really resonating with your ideal client, you're just going to almost filter out the clients you don't want and you're going to get more like-minded clients as well because the ones who hate it, they're not going to inquire, but you don't want to work with them anyway. So you're going to start, it's like a natural filter. Episode 107. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am connecting internationally all the way in Australia with Nikita Morel, who is a copywriter and marketing specialist who specifically works with helping architects win more work, stand out from their competition, and to get the recognition that we all deserve. Uh, And she does this through using easy to implement marketing plans. Um, She's recently launched launched a toolkit for architects called the Architects uh, Workshop, which helps architects write their websites and comms materials. So in this episode, uh, Nikita and I, we discuss the mistakes that architects commonly make with their language on their website. Nikita gives us a brilliant framework for how we can become more memorable in our practices. And she discusses the importance of having something to stand for in our marketing collateral or having something to stand for that we can communicate powerfully. So sit back, relax and enjoy Nikita Morel. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Nikita, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Thank you. Absolute pleasure to have you. You're a marketing specialist and consultant for architects. And you're, you're based over the other side of the world. You're in Australia. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I'm really, I'm really interested to be speaking to you today on this, uh, on this chat. You've got, um, you work a lot with, what kind of, what's, let's tell me a little bit, how did you get into, into marketing for architects and what kind of firms do you, specialize in working with and then we can talk a little bit about um the frameworks that we've got planned sure so well, firstly thank you for having me and um yeah so i guess the way i got into it is i started with a corporate marketing background um and then just realized that that big kind of corporate world was not for me and so i worked in an architecture publishing company Um, working in the editorial team as well as the sales team. So I got a bit of a handle on not only how to write, but how to sell. Um, And then I went and worked in-house for an architecture firm and started up their whole marketing comms department from scratch. And as I was working there, um, I just realised that I... What I was doing, I could be doing for more firms um, and helping, I guess, yeah, more architects do this. And I found a real kind of gap in the market. So um, for the last almost four or five years now, I've been helping architecture firms of all different sizes, um, smaller ones, right up to some of the bigger ones. um, And I work with not only yeah, I guess one man kind of solo uh, mm. entrepreneurs, but also um, the marketing departments of those bigger firms. So not only am I a marketing strategist, but I also do a lot of copywriting. So I call myself a copywriter as well. Um, and that encompasses everything from website copy to award submissions to proposals, um, bios, all that, all that gamut of things as well. Brilliant. And, 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 and how do you find the work differs from being from like larger practice to smaller practices? Is it the same sort of uh, complications that you see practices dealing with or, or, the, or does the, how does the nature of the work change? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So I guess I'll start with the bigger firms. I guess I find that there's a lot more people involved with that, yeah. especially if there's like a whole heap of principles. And um, with the bigger firms, I do run almost kind of, um, I call them discovery workshops. So I'll go in for half a day and I find that because there are so many different varying opinions, um, it takes us longer to kind of get to the core of their brand and their marketing because I guess everyone has their own say. So I do find these big discovery sessions where everyone can give their input a lot, um, you know, a lot more valuable. Whereas with the yeah. smaller firms, um, you know, I find a lot of architects have left the bigger firms to start their own firm um, because they either want to have more control of design or for whatever reason, um, they've decided to start their own firm. So they've got that big firm knowledge, but they just don't know how to express that themselves. And they're almost starting from scratch. Like, what does my brand stand for? You know, what am I? Who am I? And how yeah. am I going to position myself in this market? I suppose it's quite interesting because in a large practice, you do have, you know, in-house teams, you've got marketing specialists, that's their sole job is to do, is to do marketing, to build brand, to do the internal marketing, to do um, expressions of interest. And then as soon as you step out of that environment and set up on your own, like it, for many architects, it's the first time they've ever had to do any marketing whatsoever. And it's, it's almost a kind of totally alien thing to them but it is one of the most important things of any business is to have you know effective marketing um strategies in place and have that engine running for your business exactly and i think what you just said is it's, it's very very important is it a marketing strategy and i think the biggest mistake i find architects make is that they, you know, they come to me and they say, well, we're on Instagram and we're sending out newsletters and we're doing, and I just, it's just random acts of marketing. So I think <laughs> my biggest goal is to kind of come in there and just say, well, hang on a second, what is your strategy? And every single one of those things I just talked about, social media, um, blogging, sending out emails, they're tactics. So we need to make sure it's tied to um, a marketing objective. Um, and that's kind of part of my job. So that's, that's really interesting. So what's, what would you say the difference between a tactic and a strategy is? Sure. So I guess the way I see it is a strategy is like your roadmap. So it's your GPS system, um, whereas your tactics are like your vehicles. So it's how you're going to get to that. You know, if you say this is my destination or this is my objective, that's kind of your overarching strategy. And then the tactics are how you're going to go and get to that, to that point. So I've always kind of thought without... A great strategy there are no tactics there are no good tactics so you need to have that strategy in place to get those tactics right got it and you've got this fantastic framework here called the architects framework for becoming uh, memorable and I'll just like you, you just to kind of walk us through what this is and for those people who are on the podcast you can go into the information link and there'll be a um, a download for that and if you're watching this on YouTube you can see the image we'll put it up on the screen um, so yeah can you just walk us through what what is this framework becoming more memorable where did it come from sure so I guess um, in the beginning when I first started my business I was trying to explain to architects why marketing is important and um, I guess the biggest thing is that marketing within the architecture industry is very different from any other type of industry um, just quickly, you know, obviously the design cycle, sale, selling cycle is long, it's slow, it's complex. You know, someone might need an architect today, right now, or they might need someone in three years. So how do you stay top of mind? So that's why I created this framework. Um, I think it appeals to the kind of logic um, of architects' minds. And I thought I put it up in um, discovery sessions or what have you, and people would kind of, you know, be nodding their heads. So I thought, okay, I'll come onto something here. Um, but yes, it's called the architect's blueprint, you know, for becoming unforgettable. And um, what that is, is it's pretty much very simply just saying you need two things, um, especially in today's day of increasing competition. You know, architects are not only competing against other architects, but mm. drafts people, um, design build companies, you know, someone's best friend's sister who's binge watching grand designs. You know, everyone thinks they're a, an architect of some sort. Yeah. So, You've got a lot of competition, so you've got to do two things. Number one, you've got to stand out, um, and that's when that brand identity comes in place. So your what you look like, um, your fonts and colours and all that, but also your tone of voice. So pretty much in a nutshell, how you look, how you sound, and how you feel. 
So all your brand touch points, you know, your studio space, how you answer the phone, your email signature, all those brand elements need to be kind of aligned and consistent. Um, and that makes you distinct. Um, and then on the flip side, the other thing you need is you need to stand for one thing or something. Mm. And I think that's the biggest piece I find a lot of architects are missing is standing for that one thing and they kind of, um, you know, and what, what I mean by that is it doesn't have to be a typology that you're standing for, but it could be your design philosophy. It could be that you're a specialist in sustainability or innovation or materials or, or even your process, you know, that's the one thing you're known for. And, and then I think, they're the firms that rise to the top. If you're known for that one thing is that when a project does come to the table, immediately you think, okay, this is what I need to go so, to. So, so what's the difference between um, standing for one thing or making a kind of, yeah, making a, a, a you know, this is, this is what we do and then the danger of being perceived as a, a generalist or, or something that doesn't have a, any kind of market resonance what is, sure. is, that, is that something that, that architects deal with, do you think? Definitely. And I guess um, my experience is a lot of, I mean, you go onto any architecture website and I would say like 99% are say we are a full service or a multidisciplinary studio and we service everyone. So as you just said, um, there is this tendency to be generalist. And I think maybe there's, yeah. um, that kind of is within the industry that there's a novelty of being able to do heaps of different types of projects. But for me, what I'm saying is, is I'm not saying don't take other projects. I'm just saying that outwardly facing when it comes to your marketing, to be known as a real expert and have an area of expertise in one thing, it will help you stand out and stand apart from the rest. Um, yeah. A lot of architects say, oh, but Nikita, what happens if the market shifts or um, it changes and am I risking losing other projects? And as I said, it's not that you're not taking them. It's just that you're known and you go from all of a sudden becoming an order taker to an expert advisor and really at the end of the day all this comes down to is trust is you know if you hurt your knee and you go to the g like a general practitioner or a knee specialist let's be honest and i'm not dissing <laughs> in any way <laughs> i mean gps have saved my life so like all i'm just saying is would have a high level of compliance with a knee specialist um and and not only that, but a specialist can charge more as well. So that's a big piece is that you can command high fees if you are a specialist. So yes. That yeah, yes. And, and, and I think, you know, you, you pointed on some quite important things there that it, as an architect, if you're focusing on your process as well, I mean, some of the best architecture practices, they really do have a very clear process or they, they're able to promote their thinking about architecture. When we look at the Fosters and the Rogers of the world, um, that's a very clear, rational approach towards architecture that is very understandable that, you know, clients in different sectors can understand and be like, oh, actually, that would work for us because we're going to, that's complex sites or it's infrastructure projects. It's not necessarily bound to, to typology, but the mm. architectural language and process is very, is very clear. Um, so, so how do you, how do you work with architects to get them to start making that stand how do what what are the sort of things to to be focusing on or asking yourselves sure so um as i said as i take even with whether it's just a one person running it running an architecture practice or the bigger firms as i run them through um a discovery session so we spend a lot of time really kind of unpicking um their firm because i'm a strong believer that a brand um, isn't invented it's kind of uncovered it's discovered it's always innate so it's not my job to come in and say you need to be this this and this it's just trying to uncover the layers um, and find out why you are different and every single firm it sounds ridiculous but every single firm is different in one way mm. so it's a real process of um, understanding their ideal clients you know who they really want to work with and what are the, the projects they really um, want to work on so I kind of I um, actually have this thing where I break it down into the three P's. I kind of ask a firm, you know, what are you passionate about? So it has to be something that really you are passionate um, and you want to stand for that one thing. Um, is it profit? Like, is there a profit potential? Is there a market for it? So there's no point being really passionate, but you've got no one <laughs> to work for. And then the third thing is proficiency. So um, do you have those skills? Do you have that expertise? Um, and can you get, and even if you don't have it, can you, build on it so that people can start to trust you so when those three things are kind of pushed together you can kind of find that that point of difference um, ah okay very interesting um, yes. um, uh, and when you're asking architects about 
you know, is this a profitable sector? What kinds of, how do you establish that? Look, I mean, yeah, again, that just comes down to research. Um, so right. that's, research is a huge part, especially as a copywriter. Um, a part of my services is I will um, look at, you know, different industry trends and markets. But, I mean, you can, like in terms of residential, I, for example, if they're, I guess, um, market is growing families or that, you can say, okay, well, there is market potential there. So it, sometimes it might require a little bit more research to say, well, is that too niche? Um Seth Godin, who's a great you know marketing guru, he calls it the smallest viable market. So right. it's like saying, you know, what's that smallest viable? So it's not too small that you're not going to get anyone, but then it's not so general that you're saying that we can service everyone. So I guess it's that kind of, yeah. But yeah, you do need to research and kind of hit it on the head. The the, the sweet spot, basically. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. Got it. Great. Um. Great. So yeah. So so going back to this this framework, um, we've that's kind of coming into the the the, the brands and the, the, the making the making the stand um let's talk about how making a stand for something um so how how can you become more memorable yeah so what happens is is when you get these two things so you stand for something uh, and you're sorry you stand stand out and then you stand for something when they overlap and that as you just said is a sweet spot that what you get is visible expertise mm. so all of a sudden you're being known um, so there's no point you just standing out and being distinct if you don't have that expertise because no one's going to trust you everyone's going to say okay wow they're a loud brand but can they really do the job um, and there's no point having that expertise if no one knows who you are so you need to have those two things that come together um, and the way you become unforgettable within this industry as I said before is because it is so slow and complex the selling process behind it is you really need to stay top of mind so what I um, kind of say is when you have your deciding what marketing tactics you should be choosing is it's often best to really position yourself as a thought leader um, and start educating people um, within the market mm. on that thing that you're, you've chosen as your area of expertise so Again, you become from that order taker where you're just trying to get referrals and you're just kind of pushing at the market to all of a sudden you become, you're seen as an expert and people start coming to you um, because you have that visibility. Um, uh, what, what are some good ways that architects can become educators of their marketplace? What, are, what, would you, what works for architects in terms of, of, of becoming perceived as that expert or, you know, really, really being that expert? Sure. So it really, the first question you've got to ask yourself is who do I want as my client, my ideal clients? So for example, I, um, a lot of um, architecture firms just jump onto Instagram and they start, um, you know, putting up these beautiful images and I take a step back and I say, well, hang on a second. What, remember like what we said before is what's your objective? And they say, oh, well, you know, to get more commercial clients. And I say, well, hang on, that's not where your clients are hanging out. Uh, for commercial clients maybe you know tend to be on LinkedIn so that's where you have to be so that kind of helps you if you keep going back to your ideal clients and your objective that helps you decide where you should be so um, you know maybe then you go to be you got to be on LinkedIn and you can start posting regularly um, interacting creating a community around that or if it's more residential people that are skimming through looking for more you know, aesthetically beautiful things and maybe Instagram. Um, but other things, like there's so many things you can do in terms of tactics. There's um, speaking events, um, even, you know, cold pitching to the media and asking to be on one of their um, award judging panels. All these things, they seem like, oh, they're reserved for these big, fancy firms. But if you position yourself, and again, as I said, if you become an expert in something, then people are going to want your knowledge and skills on their platform. So you can start pitching to the media and guest blog, um, or you can start sending out newsletters. There's a lot of yeah things you can do, but I think that's where you can get overwhelmed and kind of be like, well, what should I be doing? But just keep going back to this question of, well, what do I want to achieve and who are my ideal clients and what's going to resonate with them? Yeah. Can you give us an example of some, of some really successful architects that, that either you've worked with or that you've seen who have made a really powerful stand for something and have positioned themselves well uh, in, a, in a particular area of expertise? Sure. So um, one great example is an Australian based firm called Breathe Architecture and they've got this, um, they've got another kind of sub, um, part to their firm called Nightingale Housing and they've made a real stand on social architecture and definitely um, 
maybe put a link in the, the podcast notes mm. because to their website because even just the way they've um, written their website, it's just in clear, accessible, easy to understand. So, you know, you have to remember that not everyone, you're not writing for your colleagues or your peers, um, you're writing for the general public or your prospective clients. So they've made a real stand um, with that. Um, and then another firm I would say is, I think you've had him on the podcast for is that is Scott Valentine from Bell Architects. Again, he's making a really strong, that's another um, example of how you can use your typology. So hospitality um, to make a strong stand. So there's lots of different ways. Um, yeah, you can kind of make a, a strong stand in something. And as you said, even process, there's another firm called um, Hill Architects and they have a whole page on breaking down their process um, and how they add value to um, things like that. So. And, and you mentioned there about you know, not communicating to our peer groups. Now, this is something that comes up on the show a lot. That, And one of the strengths of the architectural profession is that we are very good at um, communicating internally. And we're good at kind of looking after each other and mentoring each other and sharing information, if you like. But also we tend to, all our marketing efforts and our websites tend to end up being geared towards attracting other architects. Um, mm -hmm. And also you, you as a copywriter, um, can you, there's, there's two things here really. One, first is I want to understand or have you explain a little bit more about what, what at the role of a copywriter is and also the importance of, of getting the language right for the people that we need to be attracting, not necessarily, and how do you might do that? Sure. So um, for the first part of your question, so a copywriter, and there is a bit of confusion around this. Um, I mean, some people think it's to do with copyright law, but <laughs> definitely not. Um, so copywriters, we're not design journalists and we're not, you know, wordsmiths or writers. Um, copywriting is part art and it's part science. So mm. it's actually underpinned in psychology. Um, and marketing. Um, so really it's about compelling the reader to take action. So that could be um, making them, or not making them, sorry, compelling them to click on a certain button, to read a certain thing or um, to buy a certain thing. So that's what copywriting is. Um, so every single word is there for a reason um, and it's crafting that message in a certain way that's really going to resonate with the um, reader. And it's all about, I guess, writing um, with that reader in mind to solve their problems. So right. a big thing with the architecture, like kind of going to the second part of your question is what I see is that um, a lot of architects are very me centric and this is not, I'm not trying to make it be <laughs> offensive, but it is, it's, you know, we're award winning, we do this, we've been in business for this long. But if you think about it, I mean, even it, you as a consumer, when you're on someone else's website, you've got your own problems running through your mind and you're trying to solve your own problems. So, what I suggest is instead of saying, we are so amazing, um, switch that around and say, your project will be so amazing if you work with us. So it's kind of, you know, using that language of you mm. uh, because you're speaking to your readers directly. So that, I mean, that's one quick hack. You can kind of just go through your website and just really look at whether you're speaking directly to, to your one ideal client because as soon as you do that, they're all, all of a sudden going to, feel seen, they're going to feel heard, they're going to feel understood. And that trust factor just rises right up. Right. Okay. And that trust factor is, as you were saying, so key to, to, in order to kind of make a, have someone make a purchase decision with you or to take you on board as a, as a client ultimately. Exactly. Exactly. Got it. And, and, um, yes. And so kind of moving on, um, kind of going into that, this idea of, of, moving away from me centric marketing and, mm -hmm. and language. How, how else can you start to craft a message that resonates with your ideal market? Sure. So first of all, you really need to understand your ideal client. So you, I do, um, with all my clients, I create like a client profile. So not only am I looking at demographics, you know, age and gender and occupation, where they are in the company, but also psychographics. So really understanding their attitudes, their behaviours, you know, and most of all, like, what is the problem that they're having? So, for example, if you're a residential architect, you know, and you're an ideal client of that, that maybe they're really worried about the project just 
blowing the budget because they just don't know what to do. And they've got this, you know, architects might, might have that story attached to them or, you know, they put their design onto your project and before you know it, you're going to be over budget. So that's what their fear and their problem and challenge is. So to really um, counteract that. So you need to think about all the problems they're having and then almost answer them in your copy. So put those objections first. Um, so for example, if they're worried about budgets, in your, on your about page, you might say, we take your budget really seriously, you know, something like that. So all of a sudden in their mind, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, they get me. And again, as I was saying right. before, that trust factor. Part. But also I think with the messaging part of what you were saying is that a lot of architects, I find they find that per, like they can't be professional and have a personality, but I'm kind of on a mission to show architects that you can have both. You can be have a bit of a personality and you can be professional. There is a way to, to be able to, you know, bring them both together. Um, and that's kind of where the tone of voice piece comes in as well. So, so when you say personality, what do you, what do you mean there? Well, I think it doesn't have to be so dry. Like I can, <laughs> I can have a bit of fun with your words. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there is a way, you know, you can have that and be professional. And there are some firms that are doing this really well. There's one firm in particular called If Do Architecture. They're doing oh, yeah. a really great job. And actually there's, um, I really encourage, I don't know if you've seen um, Moz, I think that's how you said it, MOS um, Studios in New York, but they've got a great about page. Like it's really tongue in cheek. Um, it's quite sarcastic and witty. And I'm not suggesting that everyone go ahead and do that, obviously, if it's not a great fit for their firm, but. Uh, it's just it just goes to show that by injecting a bit of personality and really resonating with your ideal client you're just gonna almost filter out the clients you don't want and you're gonna mm -hmm. get more like-minded clients as well because the ones who hate it they're not gonna inquire but you don't want to work with them anyway so you're gonna start it's like a natural filter um and yeah your, your inquiries might halve but then you're gonna get ones that are more aligned with your firm as well and how do you go about establishing what the client's problems are well, again, that comes down to research. So for me, um, if I work in architecture, architecture practice, I have clients like past client interviews as part of my process. So I'll ring, um, you know, with their consent, some of their past clients and interview them to kind of say, what was your problem before working with, you know, Studio X? And then how did you feel after? Mm. Um, and again, it's research based. So the answers are all out there. Um, it's just having to dig and not make any assumptions either. So really it is all, um, I spent a lot of time um, looking on like Reddit forums um, and, and things like that to kind of see, you know, what are the problems property developers are having and what are their conversations that they're having with each other. So it's just really trying to, I guess, mine out the data. Ah, oh, that's really interesting. So you, you'll actually go and you're kind of quite keen to actually observe what property developers are saying to each other, the conversations they're having, their complaints, their, their insights, and using that as, as intelligence, essentially, to be able to craft your language. 100%. And that's what I said, like, you really want to know what makes them tick. So that's why it's so important to pick that one ideal client, because then that makes that research a lot more, um, I get. I guess, insightful and really um, accurate. So, yeah, no, I, I definitely love hearing conversations. You just want to be a fly on the wall and just kind of, you know, this architect's doing this, this and this, and then you can go in and you know, that's what they're thinking. So you can say, well, we don't do this, this and this. So, it, yeah, it definitely helps craft that message. And, and what about imagery and the pictures that architects typically use? Do, do you see any kind of trends of architects misusing pictures or or graphics that are quite common um i mean it's not really my area but what i can say is that when it comes to images what i do find is well actually last year um i studied 663 architecture websites and i gave myself a challenge to um, it was called the 30 fixes in 30 days. So each day I recorded a video and then I put them up on LinkedIn. Um, and one of the videos was all about why words matter. So I think with the imagery um, that architects use, it is important to have words and, you know, it doesn't have to be a lot, but um, words to kind of really reinforce the context. So for example, on your project description pages, um, it really helps rather than just throwing up a whole heap of images of your finished product or your mm. renders or what have you, 
to support that with words, to give the context and to give that prospective client or whoever's reading it um, or viewing it, sorry, um, you know, what they should be putting their attention on. So telling that story behind the project rather than just slapping up images, I think, um, you know, they can, words and imagery can really work together so that's kind of my take on on the whole thing so that's that's a really interesting uh study to have done to actually kind of go through and look at that that volume of architectural websites what were some of the other insights that you you got from that exercise um lots so many i think another big one was that a lot of architects don't have a really strong call to action um, meaning that they don't prompt like I saw so many using very kind of um, just not compelling language so they might say if you're interested in our services please feel free to give us a call and I think that's not strong enough you um, you know from a copywriting perspective it's almost like you need to be a bit more direct like if you want to book a 30-minute consultation here is the number to call or do this so it's kind of directing them and taking them on a journey your whole website um, and when they get to that contact page like telling them all rather than just leaving it up to them um, and actually another one that I might mention is that testimonials and I'm a big fan of having testimonials on your website and I think a few architects a bit say you know I know about social proof from a psychology perspective is just a great way for you to promote your practice without it having to come from your mouth. So, you know, really interviewing um, past clients or influencers within the architecture industry if you don't have that many past clients or, mm. you know, even um, maybe someone from the general public and sprinkling them throughout your whole website rather than just slapping them up on one page, which might not likely be read, but really kind of having that social proof throughout. Right, so it's, so it's actually breaking it up and, and, and having it kind of woven through the website as opposed to just one big page where it's all, all dropped in. Exactly, exactly. Brilliant. Yeah, so if people want to get in contact with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, is definitely head over to my website or actually even my, um, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. Fabulous. Nikita, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. That's been really insightful uh, and some really sort of powerful strategies there of how we can improve our marketing and our copy. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.